something special about corporate worship. Uh, it's a good sermon topic, isn't it, corporate worship? But I'm not going to speak about that this morning. But I just love coming together with God's people in God's house to worship Him. There's something special about coming into the presence of God. And um, when we can come into the presence of God any time because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn, right, between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple. So we can come straight in. But to come straight in with a group of people coming to God's presence and just worship and have that sense of the Holy Spirit around the place, and it's just something that's kind of like an ease that comes into the room, I reckon. It's a bit like... There's an allegory used for the Holy Spirit of being the oil of the Holy Spirit. And as we know, oil makes things smoother. It stops things from rubbing together and wearing each other out. And so as we worship God, we have the oil of the Holy Spirit in place. And it just brings that gentleness and that peace because you remember, or you probably wouldn't remember, but years and years ago they used to put oil on the water to still the waves. They wouldn't do it these days because they get the strike from the EPA, but um, it would calm the waves. And so the Holy Spirit is for us when we come into God's presence and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in God's presence. It's like that oil on the water. It's just that soothing, calming thing. And we need that, don't we? We need a bit of peace and quiet. We need a bit of just calmness in our lives because Particularly today, post-COVID, anxiety seems to be a lot more on people's radar. But you know, when you come into God's presence, you have the oil of the Holy Spirit in it, and He will ease our anxiety, He will ease our strength. We just have to let go and let God. Amen. Can you do that? We don't have to do anything, just let go. Let the Holy Spirit do it. So when I was speaking to James um, last year about coming and speaking here, and I said, do you guys have a theme? And he told me it was strong or starting is strong. I think that's correct, isn't it, James? And I was pretty excited when he told me that because it might immediately jump to Joshua chapter 1. I just want to read the first seven verses, and it says this. After the death of Moses, the servant of God, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. I always wonder that. How could you be a son of nobody? But that's... <laughs> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your feet, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, the great sea on the west. Now no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead those people or these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey, to obey the, all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, in that particular chapter, Joshua 1, God actually tells Joshua to be strong and courageous three times. One version actually has it four times, but most versions have it three times, so we'll stick with what's common. Now, the thing about this is being strong and courageous doesn't just happen. It, we can't just speak, oh, if I you know, go and pray and I, you know, I'm a good person, I get up in the morning, I'll be strong and courageous. Being strong in God is a decision that you have to make. It's just like when we worship God, we have to make a decision to worship God and to come into his presence. We need to make that decision. I will be strong in the Lord. Now, if you make the decision, just I will be strong, you're probably going to fail. But if you decide that you will be strong in the Lord, 
you're asking God to be with you, to be strong. You see, God sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and I because he wanted to restore relationship between himself and him. Between us both, yeah, I'm getting the word. I'm, I'm still jet lagged, that's my excuse. <laughs> I got it back from overseas last week and I think I could drag this out for about six months. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, so God wanted to restore relationship between himself and mankind. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed when you're in a relationship with someone or somebody, you kind of both got a little bit? Now, my wife very graciously agreed to marry me a long time ago. <laughs> and um, if she did all the work in the marriage and I did none, the marriage wouldn't survive, would it? She's shaking her head at me, so I don't think we can take that. And I think we understand that, that when we are in a relationship with somebody, both sides have a part to play, don't they? And so it is with us and God. When we are in a relationship with God, which is what happens when we're born again, you and I have a part to play. It's not all just God. But you and I have a part to play. We have to agree to be used by God. And even though the Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting in the relationship you and I still have to be a part of that. We have to make that decision. And that's why you have to make the decision to be strong in God. Let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm sure you're pretty familiar with this passage. I'm just going to read verses 10 to 18. It says this. Now, just before I start reading it, Ephesians chapter 6 is the last chapter of Ephesians, so it's Paul's concluding chapter. And he's told the church in Ephesus a whole heap of things in the preceding five chapters, but the last chapter he's wrapping it up. And in it he has some key points, and we have a takeaway here. So it says in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So at the start of that passage I just read you, Paul tells the saints in Ephesus to be strong. Once again, it's a command and it's telling us that we have to engage. If I told one of my kids when they still live at home and I can still tell them what to do, um, my younger daughter's down there smiling at me when I say that. Uh, you know, but it was no good them nodding a cent. They had to get up and go and do it. So if I said to Renee, who's with us here today, I can pick on her, she's my child. And, and I said, Renee, could you take the rubbish out, please? And she said, yes, Dad, I'll do that. But she didn't get up and take the rubbish out. Nothing happened, did it? And so when God says to us, be strong. You, you probably all make mental sense. I mean, we read the Bible, we all believe that the Bible is a divinely inspired word of God, and so we just, on an intellectual level at least, we agree with it. But agreeing intellectually really doesn't cut the mustard. We have to put legs on that and get up and take the rubbish out, or whatever it is that God tells us to do. So we need to take on board 
that we need to be strong. God wants your participation. I have a really cute photo at home somewhere. I've got to find it. We just moved, so some stuff is still missing in action. Many years ago, we built a new side fence on our house when we lived in Wagga, and my parents came over to, um, to help. And there's this photo of my father, he's bending over like this, and my oldest daughter, who was about two at the time, it's about 18 months, and they are very young, she's handing my father some nails so he can nail the wood up on the new side fence. Now, let's be truthful, her helping him probably slowed him down. <laughs> But there was a, my father experienced the, the, the delight of my daughter passing him the nails. And so our Heavenly Father is with us. When we come and do what he has told us to do or asked us to do, when we contribute our bit, that brings great delight to our Heavenly Father. And any of us here that are parents that have had our children, particularly when they're little, come and help, we acknowledge at least once again, on an intellectual plane, that they're probably slowing us down, but the delight is seeing them helping. That delights God. And we need to delight God, because He is our Heavenly Father. And as we sung earlier this morning, He's worthy of all praise. And our job here on earth is to bring Him glory. And we do that by doing what He tells us to do. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But Paul's really good in this passage. He not only tells us to be strong, he gives us some tips on how to do it. And I'm not going to touch on all of them, I just want to touch on a few of them. But he says in verse, verse 14, he says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. We need to know the truth. The truth is contained in the Word of God. Now, 10 years ago, I would have waved my Bible at you. You know, because I used to preach from the Bible. My eyesight was a lot better than I could read. Now I do my preaching notes in an 18 point font, so I can read them. <laughs> okay. And most of us have our Bibles on our phones or our iPads or our tablets or whatever. But that book that we call the Bible, it contains the truth. As I mentioned earlier, that it, it, it is the divinely inspired Word of God, and it's good for us. Now, how can we put on the belt of truth unless we know it? The first thing you need to do to be strong is you need to read the Word of God. There are dozens of different ways of reading the Word of God, dozens of different programs. You need to find the one that works for you, but you need to stick your nose in the Word of God, I would suggest, at least every day. Just time, take time to read, ask God to reveal what he's saying to you through it. And as you start to absorb the word of God, it will empower you, it will make you strong. There's a passage that says things in Proverbs that out of the issues of the heart, the mouth speaks. I worked in IT for a number of years, that's why I have grey hair. <laughs> and um, when I first started, I, had a, well, I still had a really good friend, very knowledgeable. He was a systems engineer and he taught me a lot of stuff. <coughs> and he wanted to teach me to program, to write programs. He said, Peter, the first rule of programming you've got to remember is garbage in, garbage out. So if your program was rubbish, you'd get rubbish out of the computer when you tried to run that program. You and I have the world's most powerful computer between our two ears. We put rubbish in there, rubbish will come out. You need to put the good stuff in there. You need to read the Word of God so you put good stuff in there. You really need to listen to some praise and worship to put the good stuff in there. If you listen to praise and worship while you're working or whatever, it's a good way of subconsciously programming your brain with good stuff. Is Christian music. And now I'm not saying you can't listen to secular music. I listen to secular music. Pam and had a look at my music library. You can see there was a fair spread of a whole heap of things. But I take care to listen to Christian music because I want, when I am talking to people, particularly as I pastor a church, as you may be aware, I want the good stuff to come out. 
I don't want to lead anybody astray. I want the word of God to come out of my mouth so that I give them the right advice, I say the right things, and I glorify God. And you can do that. Look, even if you only have time to read a few verses every day, but you take care to listen to praise and worship during the day, particularly, you know, just when you're working, you don't have to sit there and act and listen to it. You'll program your mind. Our minds need programming to be godly because naturally they're ungodly. And, you know, the Holy Spirit, when we were born again, the Bible says that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the very end. So that means that when you got born again, the Holy Spirit started working in your life to make you like Jesus. That's his determination to make you like Jesus. Now you'll be that, whatever your name is, flavor of Jesus, of course. He does, he's not interested in making claims. We need to let that process happen. We need to let the Word of God work its way out in our lives. It's interesting, we have the breastplate of righteousness. Now, I think you would all understand that when we were born again, when we became a Christian, we were made righteous by the shed blood of Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches us. And it's really interesting that this passage talks about righteousness being the breastplate because the breastplate protects our heart. Righteousness protects our heart. We need to foster that righteousness. It's no good saying, oh, you know, in God's eyes, I'm righteousness. We need to aim to try and live a righteous lifestyle. And a good place to start doing that is by reading the Word of God. It all swings back. The next thing is the shield of faith, which protects the bodies. And of course, in the, in the day when Paul wrote this, the Roman soldiers, they had big shields. When they went out to battle, they weren't just taking some little dicky shield. They had shields that were nearly as tall as them. It protected the whole person. The shield of faith. We need to believe the word of God. We need to believe what God says to us. A good way to do that is to read the I know I'm kind of banging back on this, but it's a really important thing. If you feel that you're weak as a Christian, I'm really going to... If I was a betting man, I bet you're not reading enough of the Word of God, or you may not be reading the Word of God. Well, it's really easy for Christians to not read the Word of God because the devil doesn't want us to, and he puts as many distractions in front of us as he possibly can because he doesn't want to read us to read the Word of God because he knows it makes us strong. And we're so lucky today that we don't necessarily have to pick up a Bible to read the Word of God. You can, you know, this pro- well, I remember once sharing a room with a pastor we were away and he, his way of reading the Bible was he had the Bible on his iPad and he had the iPad read it to him. And, you know, you can get the Bible and you can play it in your car, you can play that from your phone. There's whole heaps of different ways to do it, but it's so much easier today to read the Bible. It's just so important because when we read the Bible, it builds our faith. And as we read the Bible, it encourages us to trust in God, to put our trust in Him. And as we trust in Him, and we see that trust, the the fruit of that trust where God comes through, we were singing about God coming through in all sorts of different ways and then earlier this morning, it builds up our faith. We need that faith, don't we? Then in verse 17, he says, Take the helmet of salvation. Now, helmets protect your head. And our head is probably the most vulnerable part of our body. And so the helmet of salvation, that means we need to be born again. If you don't know Jesus, today is a great day to do it. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't have to wait till the, you know, Sunday's a nice day to be born again, so it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. If you don't know God, come and talk to Simon. He'd like to introduce you to, to Jesus and you can be born again today. But it's really important to have that because that is part of our protection. That helps make us strong. Now just on to, as I wind this up, Hebrews chapter 5. Thanks, Simon. Let me read it to you. It says, In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word over and over again. 
You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by the constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. <laughs> now by having coincidence, Betty and I were, over, were coming over to Canberra this weekend to celebrate our daughter's birthday. And um, I can remember when our daughter was born, a little while ago now, She's a very cute baby. I have to say nice names. No, it's true, she's a very cute baby. And, and Betty and I took a great deal of delight in her as a baby and then a you know, little girl and as she grew up. But um, Renee turned 30 last week. Now, if Renee was still like a baby, we'd be worried. It's a long time to be a baby, 30 years. And I have seen babies here in the, the room this morning. You can see one over there right now on Sarah's lap. And when we're first born again, we like baby Christians. We need the milk of the word. And when you're a baby, you don't really contribute a lot. You get contributed to, you know, you're fed, your nappies change, you bathe, you sleep. It's a pretty good life. But eventually there comes a point where you start to take on as a person responsibility for different things. I always used to say that when you have a baby, when the child can feed itself, take itself to the toilet and get itself dressed, you are 90% of the way there, and you know, it's all downhill from that point in time. And as parents, when we have babies, you know, that's kind of a desire of our hearts that they can feed themselves, etc., etc. So it makes life a little easy for us, and we move on to the next step. Now, God is the same with us. In our society, in our Western society, it's really easy to be a baby Christian. You come to church on Sunday, we don't get persecuted in Australia, nobody's bombing our churches or anything like that. We can just show up to church on Sunday, hear a great sermon, enjoy the praise and worship, enjoy the company of the people around us, but not mature in our faith. Paul here is saying, hey guys, you can't sit on your backside and be a baby Christian forever. You need to get it together and grow up and be the mature Christian that God wants you to be. Remember I said earlier that the Holy Spirit's plan is to make us like Jesus. When you're like Jesus, you're not a baby anymore. And being a mature Christian means being strong. I think that's a great thing. I might pinch it for next year if that happens. Where we're up to... We need to be strong, we need to take that determination because God has a plan and a purpose for you guys. He has a plan and a purpose for this church. James read out of Jeremiah a bit earlier. But God has a plan for us. And we often read that verse and we think that that was written to us as individuals, but we need to remember that most of the Old Testament was written to the nation of Israel. So when Jeremiah prophesied that, he was prophesying corporately, right? to the nation of Israel. So that's a prophecy to us as the church that God has plans for us. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of that plan. Because I know that the best place to be is right in the middle of God's will. If you really want to be satisfied, that you that desire that's in your heart for this satisfaction for this interface, the best place to be, the place to find it is right in the middle of God's will. And I can tell you right now that right now part of God's will for all of us is to be strong. Because there are lots of passages in Scripture that talk about being strong. So as Horizon Church moves through 2024, take that under your belt, take that to heart. Be determined to be strong in the Lord. You see, when we do stuff with God, we don't do it by ourselves. We do it with the Holy Spirit. You see, because part of our job, part of the call in our lives is to bring glory to God. If God asks us to do something, if God tells us to do something, it's not his plan for us to fail. Because if we fail, that doesn't bring him any glory at all. But when we succeed because of the power in the Holy Spirit, that brings God glory, and I want to be a part of that. So I know that I need to be strong. I know that you need to be strong. So God bless you all. Thank you for having me. Thanks, God.
thank you. Thanks, uh, Pastor Peter. It's great to hear from you this morning. That's a huge encouragement. Isn't it incredible for those of you who were last here last week for Pastor Alan's message? He also had a prompt in there to get into God's Word. And isn't it incredible the way that God speaks? We've had that again this morning. So this is your your extra reminder, church. If you are are struggling with with getting into God's Word, this is a reminder for you at the start of this year. Let's be a church and let's be people who, who read God's Word and live it out. Amen?